Today, we are looking at this important and iconic professional camera from Canon, the F1. It was produced from 1971 to 1981. There are three versions of this camera, F1, F1N, and new F1. What I demonstrate here today represents F1 and F1N. The Canon F1 was meant as a direct competitor to Nikon F, but almost a decade later, it takes a similar path as a true system camera. According to Canon's own literature, it had 10,000 component parts. They claim to demonstrate reliability unmatched by any other product in the photographic industry, i.e. nudge nudge wink wink Nikon. Nikon F2. That was a brand to beat. Even though other Japanese brands like Pentax, Minolta, and Olympus were also doing incredibly innovative things, but in a different market segment. At the time Canon F1 was launched, to some extent thanks to Nikon, you could completely forget about competition from Germany, either West or East. It did not matter anymore. It is questionable if Canon F1 was meant as a competitor to Nikon F2, since the release dates for Nikon F2 and Canon F1 were so close. There was little time for Canon to try to change the design and compete with the new features of F2, but in fact, it was marketed as such. In 1976, Canon made only minor improvements to F1. The industry and commentators have labeled the improved version of Canon F1, F1N, is that the original F1 had the ISO range up to 1800, but the F1N goes up to ISO 3200. Also, the F1N advanced lever has a shorter run than the original F1, but a longer offset of 30 degrees rather than 15 degrees. Other minor improvements include the plastic tip to the film advanced lever, a MIMO back, and a few other things. The full list of changes from F1 to F1N is here, if you want to review on your own. Canon new F1 is a totally new design launched in 1981 with a mixed mechanical and electronic operation by the time it came out in 1981, it was competing with Nikon F3, not F2. That's a story for another day. F1 was Canon's first successful professional-grade SLR camera system. The eye of the professional photographer. No two are alike. With this in mind, Canon designed the F1 concept. No two F1s need be alike. Canon technology created a vast system of components that enable the photographer to create the camera that best meets his needs. The Canon F1. One more reason Canon's first in fine photography. Canon's FD lenses were introduced at the same time as the F1, but Canon maintained some limited compatibility with earlier FL and R lenses. FD lenses lasted until the EF or electrofocus lenses were introduced in 1987, and those were not backward compatible. Canon's FD Super Telephoto lenses were the first to be produced in white color. These were designed to reduce the thermal impact and expansion or cracking of the fluorite lens elements. At sports events, white means Canon even to this day. This beautiful shiny black finish is a fingerprint magnet. That's why I'm wearing these gloves. So as I demonstrate all the features to you, I continuously polish it for you as well. It's the advanced lever, 30 degrees open, around 39 degrees swing. It's a shorter swing in this model. Shutter release button, which takes cable release as well in the middle. It has a lock over here, L for lock, A for action. To get to this position, you rotate this knob around. To go to the lock position, you twist it to the left. The white dot goes around and comes to this side. If you put in a cable release, it will bypass the lock and it will still work with the cable release, even on the lock position. This is a shutter dial, which has all the speeds up to 2000. Flash sync is at 1 60th of a second or lower. Lowest speed is 1 full second and then B. 
The index for the B is not on the B, it's a dot below the B. ASA setting, which is the same as ISO, is in this little window over here. The maximum is 3200. The minimum is 25. This might look superficially like that button in the middle of the dial for Nikon F2 and F3, but in fact it has no function, you can't press it. This knob that sticks out is for some of the accessories that you can attach. On this side, we don't have very much except an accessory shoe that takes an adapter which then takes the flash. The adapter is similar to this one. This is not Canon, this is Nikon, but the principle is the same. This goes over the top here, flash goes over the top. Now this similarity with Nikon, is that accidental or somebody has been looking at the competition? Who knows? This provides light to the inside of this viewfinder for the exposure needle. Exposure meter is a CDS photocell coupled to shutter speeds, film speed, and f-stops. On the back of the camera, we have this dial, which goes between on position, off and flash position, and C for battery check, C for check. It has a helpful little hint over here, which says you put the ASA dial on 100, you put the shutter speed on 2000, put this on C, look inside, needle goes to a fixed index mark. That means the battery is good. The bottom of the camera is very simple. Film rewind button, battery chamber. It takes one mercury battery. Nowadays you can't find those, so you have to take an SR44 or LR44 with an adapter. That works well. It's a tripod mount. This is a multifunction dial. It does three different things. One of them is self timer. You wind. Push this all the way down, not halfway, but all the way down, otherwise it won't work. Release. It takes 10 seconds, nothing in between. The second function is depth of field preview or stop down metering. For that, you want to narrow down your aperture to the maximum that has been set over here. Okay? Press this against the camera, the opposite direction. You press this in, that is narrowing down the aperture. I hope you can see it in here. If you want to leave it in that mode and continue in the stop down mode, press it in and lock it to that red mark over there. Press this to there and it stays in place. Do you want to release it? You push it back again. Third function is a mirror lockup. One more time, you press this against the body of the camera. This time, you press this all the way to the M position. Mirror goes up. To release it, you push this back. To release this, push it one more step. When you press this against the camera, look over here. It exposes a red dot. That is a warning. In this position, whether it's manually pressed or is locked, you should not mount a lens. If you do that, the lens will not be able to communicate to the body of the camera and um, the aperture system will not work. That neatly brings us to the subject of the lens. The original FD lens had this type of breech lock. Put that red dot on the red index over there and twist this ring to the right. It is secure now. You take it off, twist this to the left, and pull it out. Unlike Nikon F and F2, you don't have to do anything manually. The lens will automatically communicate the settings to the camera. The lenses were also updated to FDN. Now these don't have that ring. Instead, they have a button, like Olympus. Match the index, twist to the right, it's a simple bayonet. You take it off, press that button, and twist to the left. Very simple. So this is the lens that came with that camera. 
it's matched because they're both the N variety. This one was made even later than that body because it came with this cap, which is from the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. To load the film, you press this security button over here, pull this out, the back lid opens. This is the super thin titanium or titanium focal plane shutter, which you can see working. A take-up spool is very, very secure because it has not only the easy grooves over there to put the film in, it also has teeth. It grabs the edge of the film. That's in addition to the sprocket wheels. It's very, very secure. There are no more extra features. For example, there's no exposure compensation anywhere. There's no diopter adjustment ring. There is no viewfinder shutter. However, if you need diopter adjustment, you can get them and screw them into here, just like this ring over here. But this is for a different purpose. This is a simple ring without any lens in it because you can take that off and you can put in a 90 degree finder over here. You can screw that in, look through here. That's for very precise focusing. For example, for macro photography. This is a systems camera. So all the parts can be exchanged. For example, the viewfinder. Press this button and this button and pull out. A very simple and easy mechanism. Focusing screen can be changed very easily. There are two notches here. Get your fingernails or something underneath those and pull this up. It comes out. Very easy. We'll push it back. The viewfinder has no electronics or displays of any kind inside it. It's only the pentaprism. So where is everything? Where is the light meter? It's in the body on the left side. So the job of this is only to display it. That principle is the same as Nikon F3, quite unlike Nikon F and F2, which had the finder housing the light metering system. The metering needle inside is on the left side and the light for it comes from here. But the pentaprism mechanism changes it from left to right. What you see is on the right. To put this back, slide it in and it kicks in position. The exposure meter is the match needle type and TTL or through the lens. It uses a CDS photocell. The rectangular area in the viewfinder shows the area being measured, which is 12% of total. On the right side of the viewfinder, you see the light meter and shutter speed. Unfortunately, the selected aperture is not shown. With FD lenses, the camera measures the light through the lens with the widest aperture and shows the result with a straight needle. Changing the shutter speed or the ISO dial will push the needle up or down. Changing the aperture on the lens will move the round needle up or down giving the needle a target to match. This will indicate the correct exposure. This is the way the camera adjusts for the aperture that you select, even though the aperture remains wide open until you press the shutter button. If the needle reaches the two red zones, it indicates that the camera cannot compensate any further for the under or over exposure. To use top-down metering, press the multifunction lever towards the camera. The circle needle will disappear and only the straight needle and the fixed index remain. Now, you find that the shutter speed, the aperture setting, and the ISO setting will move the needle up or down. Your target is now the fixed index. Match the needle to the fixed index, and you will have correct exposure. With this feature, Canon has made the light measurement almost as easy, whether you're using an open aperture lens like FD or stop-down lens like FL. The film plane indicator is here, if you want to set a very accurate distance manually but the focusing scale on the lens doesn't have such a level of accuracy marked on it. So how are you supposed to set an accurate distance of say 33.5 centimeters? Hmm? Who knows, it's a mystery. This older lens is a breech lock mount. 
It is a 50 mm f1.4. On the lens, it says SSC, which stands for Super Spectral Coating. Another way of saying it's a multi coated lens. Before these, the lenses were labeled SC, or Spectral Coating, or Single Coating. This is our newer FT lens with a bayonet mount. It's a 28 mm f2.8. These don't say SC or SSC, but they are actually multi coated similar to SSC. If the FD lens is to be used in the full manual mode or with accessories between the lens and the camera or back to front for macro photography, push the manual aperture lock lever to the right until it locks. This deactivates the open aperture system and allows you to select the exact aperture that you want. But be sure to unlock by pushing the lever to the left before mounting the lens directly on the camera body again. This being a system camera has interchangeable back and bottom. To attach the motor drive, remove the battery cover and pull out the bottom cover, starting from the battery side. It'll come out. To remove the back cover, slide the pin on the hinge. Standard focusing screen has split image and micro prism. There are eight others, making it a total of nine. Apart from the standard viewfinder, there are four others, boosted T-finder for very low light, servo EE finder for shutter priority automatic aperture, there's speed finder and waist level finder. Couple of interesting things. When you finish the film and you want to rewind it, you pull this back and you rewind like many cameras. If you do this upside down and you do that, you will see this little dot go around the circle. That means film is coming out. When that stops rotating, it means that the film leader is out of the take-up spool. At that point, you can stop immediately. That means that you can leave a little bit of the leader outside the cartridge. That was a good feature. And there are a couple of uh, weird features too. For example, if you want to use the self-timer as a way of reducing vibration, for example, instead of cable release, which is a good idea, you might also like to lock the mirror up, right? Okay, so let's do it. We lock the mirror up, press this against the camera body, push this to the M, okay, mirror is up now. So let's uh, set the self timer. All right, we'll push this down, right? Push this down, whoops. It pushes that down and the mirror is back. So it didn't work. The solution is to remember, first wind the film, then set the self timer, then push this back up, then push against the camera body, then lift the mirror up. Did you remember all that sequence? And now you shoot. You see this little dot now rotating up. Okay, mirror remained up and it shot. Now you push this back, you're back to normal. Another weird thing is a T setting. There's no T setting, right? What do we do? All right, you have to improvise. Okay, so it's on the, on the tripod. Okay, we haven't shot anything yet. We put this on a B. Okay, all good. It's very steady on the tripod. Then what we have to do is to wind. Okay, so far no vibration. Then we have to press this with one finger. Not cable release, mind you, with a finger. Then with another finger, you have to twist this to the left and release this, okay. Hopefully we haven't vibrated anything. And then after 30 minutes, you come back and twist this back again very carefully. Uh-huh, it releases. I don't think that's a great feature, do you? Another weird thing, after you load the film, you see that the film counter has gone to S for start. You do two blank shots one, 
2. Now you're ready to go. The index shows 0 though, so the first shot is 0. The second shot is 1. So the last shot, presumably 36 shots, is 35. Right? So presumably 35 is your last shot, not 36. That's a bit odd, isn't it? Double exposure. What you do is shoot the first one, then you press the rewind button. It holds in place. Wind and shoot again. That's your second shot on the same frame. The frame has not moved. You can repeat this. Press this again and shoot again. You can do this again. When you finish with your exposures, you can continue the normal way. Now the film is being advanced. So we did um, three multiple exposures on the same frame. But look, the counter has counted all of those as if we did the real advance. So if you keep doing this, do multiple exposure and so on, on a 36 exposure film roll, you will run out of numbers, right? So what happens then? No idea. In conclusion, my own personal opinion, I really enjoyed using this camera as much as I enjoyed using Nikon F2. It's that kind of class of camera. Fully mechanical, easy to use, very reassuring in every way. I love the sound of the shutter, the weight of it, the seriousness of it, the simplicity of it, nothing that I didn't want and everything that I wanted. The results are also great. For a fully mechanical camera, high quality, interchangeable everything. Now all these parts can be found even today on eBay. Every part, this, 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 even this, this. It looks good, looks serious, takes great pictures, zero defects. I love it. If you're thinking of buying one, don't hesitate. Go ahead. Whether it's F1 or F1N doesn't make any difference. Get this version, fully mechanical one. I wouldn't worry about the new F1, which is half electronic. I think this is a better version, F1N or the original F1. Thanks for staying with me to the end. If you want to see the real competition, see these videos. They provide plenty of history and intriguing background. I'll see you with the next video.